All right. Today is Thursday, February 24th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. What a day, what a day, what a day. Matter of fact, what a night. But let's start with this. My heart goes out to the Ukrainian people and the Russian people for that matter because they're going to suffer from the actions of this delusional madman. With that being said, let's talk about the market and what took place today because it was a ride, a wild one to say the least. And your boy, the maverick of Wall Street, got it right today in buying the dip. And I held your hand and I walked you throughout the day like a baby, step by step on Twitter. And I will go through that again in this show just to show you what I saw that made me feel that this day will be a buy the dip kind of day and we will see a massive relief rally. Where do we go from here? We will go through that and a lot more. But isn't this funny? As the invasion was unfolding last night, there was a lot of fear. Stock market futures were down big. Commodities futures were surging higher, pushing inflation expectations out of whack. And of course, a lot of panic, a lot of expectations of a crash, yada, yada, yada. But I think by now, we figure out that the stock market loves tragedies. Matter of fact, I tweeted this. Watch out how the market rallies tomorrow on World War III optimism. As a joke, of course. But the irony is, it turned out to be the case. And boy, the real bombardment was not in Ukraine, it was in my Twitter account, because I was tweeting, 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 day and night. So let's go through all of these tweets and figure out why I came to the conclusion that the market will rally today. And here it is, folks, in focus tonight. How about World War III optimism? Let's start by this. In yesterday's video, we ranked the hierarchy of the items on the wall of worry. And number one, this will always be the case, is the hawkish Fed, the Federal Reserve. This is what really matters for the stock market. And then we have a number two, Russia, Ukraine, because it ties in with inflation and the hawkish Fed. Number three, China. Number four, DC. And lastly, number five, the thing. Another thing we talked about in yesterday's video, which is the fact that the market got very oversold, specifically in certain corners. These corners happen to be the high growth, high momentum names, the really oversold beaten names, and we were waiting for a spark. We were just waiting for a spark to ignite the relief rally. And this spark came from the Fed, which is the number one item on the wall of 40. Did the Fed announce anything today? Of course not. But market expectations did the job. Once again, this is a game of expectations. Now, I've been telling you over and over and over again this program, this market cares not about civil wars, pandemic pandemics, nuclear wars, invasions, asteroids, dinosaurs, the extinction of humanity. Matter of fact, if there were no human beings left on the planet, but the printing machine in the Fed continues to go on, stocks will continue to go higher because there's nothing matter to the stock market besides the cocaine. And that's all there is, baby. More coke, we go higher. Less coke, we go down. And of course, it is a game of expectations once again. The expectations were not for more coke because of the Russia-Ukraine tensions, but the adjustment of expectations that we got today is for the fact that we're not removing as much coke as we thought before from the stock market. Meaning, the 50 basis points hike, that is poof gone, at least for now. Another point, you have to approach this market with two mentalities, two different mentalities, the mentality of the investor and the mentality of the trader. Are you an investor or are you a trader? If you are an investor, then you have the long-term trajectory. If you are a trader, then you have a short-term trajectory. I happen to be both, and I believe that the majority of you are both investors and traders. A lot of you get mad at me when I become a little bit bullish sometimes. Now, make no mistake, I'm the king of bears. And the reason is, this garbage stock market, this hypermania bubble, has created insane inflation in the economy, and inflation will destroy the stock market. So you cannot be bullish on the stock market in the long run. In the meantime, this market will present us with trading opportunities. And there's a lot of money to be made here. My goal is to make you money, not to serve my ego. So when I see trading opportunities that we have to be bullish on, we have to buy betting on the upside, then I'm going to call that for you. But these are trading opportunities in the short run. And then we have the long run perspective, the investor perspective. So you got to keep that in mind, folks. 
and today was one of these days. The market presents us with the pieces of the puzzle, little clues here and there. Our job is to grab these pieces, put them together quickly. You got to think fast, act fast. And if you can't do that, then you shouldn't be in this business. But I help you to do that, to piece the pieces of the puzzle every single day in this program. Matter of fact, on my Twitter account, but all of this is for free, baby. Now, the trading opportunity for the day was the adjustment in expectations. What expectations are we talking about once again? Again, interest rate hikes, meaning tapering the cocaine and the so-called accommodation to the stock market. It's not going to be as severe as we thought before due to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And here's once again, Mohamed Alarian explaining all of that to you perhaps better than I could. So I, it, this takes 50 basis points completely off the table. It takes the eight, nine hikes that a lot of people were talking about for this, day, for this year off the table, and, and thankfully so, because you heard me say on your show that I didn't think the U.S. economy could accommodate and live with such slamming of the brakes of monetary policy. Um, it means the Fed is going to have to be even more careful, and it's going to have to tolerate higher inflation. Um, nobody wanted to be here, um, but we were already far away from the world of first best in terms of monetary policy, and now we're going to go get even further away. So we're going, to, we're going to have a very sort of unsatisfactory situation when it comes to inflation and when it comes to growth, unfortunately. Mohammed, I've, I've had very uh, smart investors explain to me that when you're dealing with inflation as high as we have it already, at 7 percent plus, um, that you're already at the point that the only way to resolve this inflation picture is to put, put the economy into a recession. Do you disagree with that? So historically, that's been the case. Historically, when inflation gets this high and the Federal Reserve has lost its inflation credibility and has lost the policy narrative, they are forced to slam on the brakes. Um, so historically, that's been absolutely correct. The question right now is, would they do that in the midst of a geopolitical shock? Um, I put out an article in the Financial Times earlier this week, and I said, you know, when you look at the probability, it's pretty even between whether they slam on the brakes or alternatively they tolerate higher inflation and just push the problem down the road. This, you know, we've, we've talked about this over and over again. This is the situation everybody was afraid of, that by being late, you have fewer policy options. So again, you can hear from Mohamed Alarian's commentary that in the short run, meaning the Marsh meeting, the 50 basis points hike is gone. We might get 25 basis points. We might get nothing. And the greedy pig market loves the fact that the Fed is not going to raise interest rates as much as we thought. This is the short-term perspective. But if you heard the other part of Mohamed's comments, he says that we're now in a dilemma. And this dilemma is the Fed will kick the can down the road using the conflict as an excuse to do that. But sooner or later, they're going to have to revisit the issue once again. And when they do that, inflation will be much higher. And therefore, the Fed will have to slam their foot in the brake once again. So in the long run, the problem that rattled the stock market this year so far will only get amplified. What does that mean? Whatever bounce we get right now, it is a bear market ratty meaning a transitory rally. You play that as a trade, and then we're going to fade it again when the time is right. But as an investor, you got to keep in mind that nothing changed to the better as we speak right now. If anything, things change to the worse because the inflation problem will get worse and the Fed will have to be more aggressive sooner or later. And here's a great take that explains what I just talked about from Lisa Abramowitz. The tweet says... Russia's invasion of Ukraine may delay, but not stop the ECB's stimulus exit. This is the European Central Bank. Governing Council member Robert Hosman, he says it is clear that we are moving toward normalizing monetary policy. It is possible, however, that the speed may now be somewhat delayed. Cue the orgasm for now. Cue the nuclear bomb for later. But for now, we're here today and we want to take advantage of trading opportunities. So let's walk you step by step in my tweet storm, the clues I gave you and how I spotted that today will be a buy the dip kind of day. Here's a tweet at around 6.04 Pacific time before the market even started trading, I gave you a flashback to August of 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia. It's a chart of the SPY. As you can see, 
The market took a massive leg down, but that dip was transitory. The dip was bought, and the market recovered shortly after. Of course, there were other problems that followed thereafter, the Lehman Brothers collapse and the financial crisis, yada yada yada. But this was clue number one that I gave you in the morning. And then around 6.14, before the market even opened, I dropped another clue for you. The tweet reads, On the long run, an investor's perspective, this is bad because inflation expectations moved a lot higher, which means sooner or later the Fed will slam on the brakes. From a shorter term trading perspective, Easing high expectations plus oversold technicals equals buying opportunities. Then another one, around 6.16, once again, before the action even started, somebody asked me, are you going to close puts? And I answered, I'm closing my triple Q's puts to capture the elevated IV. And then came a confirmation from the market at around 6.51. So the market was already trading at this point. I tweeted this, traders are taking profits from oil. I'm buying the dip in beaten down stocks. This was a confirmation that the market is rotating from winners to losers, and hence buy the dip in the oversold names. Here's the confirmation. Look at Exxon Mobil, for example. This is a five minutes chart. And as you can see, today's action. The chart opened gapping up big, but the selling was immediate. They were taking profits from Exxon right away. On the other hand, here's the chart for the Qs, the NASDAQ. As you can see, immediately the dip was being bought. So we were seeing the rotation from winners to losers right away. You gotta combine these clues in real time, the pieces of the puzzle right away, because if you can't do that, you're not gonna be good at trading the stock market. Lucky for you, you got me, and I'm for free, baby. I don't charge nothing. Here's another tweet, 656. We're now about 30 minutes in the action. I tweeted this, I would not be surprised if the Nasdaq closes in the green today. I didn't say the Dow. I didn't say the SPY. I said the Qs because the Qs were the majority of the oversold conditions are, or were, at least. Another one, at around 6.57 Pacific time, somebody asked me about the PayPal trade. It was, at that point, a pie-in-the-face trade, but I answered right away and said I averaged down. I bought the dip in that trade right away, averaging down big time. And what do you know, by the end of the day, the pie-in-the-face trade turned out to be a steak and lobster kind of trade. This is how you manage these kind of trades. You gotta be confident, piece the pieces of the puzzle together, and make a decision right away. Another one. We're now at around 7.14, about 45 minutes in the action. A trader asked me, what is the play here, Maverick? Up pretty big so far. Think this run is good for a day or two. My answer was, we were very oversold from the get-go. The tape for now is taking profits from recent winners and buying the dip in the losers. The thinking about inflation will come later. For now, the conflict keeps the Fed cautious about being too aggressive. This is what the market is fixated on right now. Sooner or later, the market will wake up and sober up and realize that inflation is moving higher. The conflict is actually bad because the Fed will slam on the brakes sooner or later. Another one, at around 8.30, we're now trading about two hours in the action. Somebody asked me, if there are no hikes, doesn't this mean everything is going up? Question mark. And I said, sell the winners, buy the losers. Technicals matter. This is not about no rate hikes. This is about a temporary adjustment in rate hike expectations for now, for today and perhaps the next few days. This is all there is. Rate hike expectations could move higher again if we have more developments in the conflict and the inflation picture, meaning commodities prices. But for now, when you have an adjustment of rate hike expectations, at least for today, and this adjustment is to the downside, meaning lower interest rate hikes, which kind of stocks were the beneficiary of higher interest rate expectations? Value stocks. Now, which stocks were the victims of higher interest rate hikes expectations? The answer is growth stocks. The high valuations, high multiple kind of stocks. And these are the kind of stocks that bounce higher the most today. Meanwhile, value stocks, the safety, dividend stocks, lag the market today. And then came the cherry on top. Be careful here because the market is being a little too greedy. The market is taking whatever you throw its way. And this cherry on top came from the so-called sanctions. Ooh, we're going to sanction Putin. Putin is shitting his pants with these destructive sanctions. The likes that you've never seen before. So what are these sanctions? Here's the tweet from the UK. Boris Johnson announced 
Sanctions details. Asset freeze against all major Russian banks. Who cares? Do these Russian banks even have assets in Britain? How big are these assets to begin with? Did they move some of these assets back to Russia and China before the invasion even started? Then, in the list of sanctions, a ban on Russian firms raising finance on UK markets. We already knew that. There's nothing new here. And lastly, limits on Russian nationals banks deposits. Ooh, Putin's so scared right now. And then came the retaliatory action from the US. We kicked out the second ranking diplomat in Washington DC. And notice here, not the first ranking one, the second ranking. So we're already starting with the wrong foot, being too mild again. And then came President Joe Biden. Finally, he woke up and he issued a new list of sanctions, just like Britain, punishing Russian banks, and oligarchs, yet not removing Russia from the SWIFT banking system, or sanctioning Putin himself, or even sanctioning Russian exports, which was the worry for the market. That Russian exports, specifically oil and gas, will be sanctioned, we will see higher commodities prices. None of that took place. And immediately, the moment Joe Biden finished speaking, I tweeted this, honestly, these are not severe sanctions. They were expected by Russia. And right away, the Russian stock market, which was closed by the way, but the Russian stock market futures shot up higher immediately by double digits and the Russian ruble traded higher off the laws. What does that mean? Once again, these are mild sanctions. The worst case scenario that the market was worried about did not happen at all. And when we talk about the oligarchs, they were already prepared for these sanctions. They made their moves. So what is the harm here? For Russia, maybe punishing the Russian people, but certainly not the oligarchs or Putin. No deterrent here whatsoever. And this becomes really important because when we look at the wall of worry, we have China. And the thinking when it comes to China is, if the invasion of Ukraine is successful and Russia is not punished severely, then China will be encouraged to take over Taiwan. Matter of fact, today we saw some encouragements. Taiwan reported nine Chinese aircrafts in their defense zone. And in response to this, the CCP mouthpiece propagandist came out and said, get used to it. There may be more PLA aircraft fly there tomorrow. So again, the market got excited because the cocaine is what really matter for the market. But we're not done with the wall of worry. We could have another shoe to drop right away if we see China taking over Taiwan. But why wouldn't they? The so-called sanctions that Russia got today were pretty much a green light for Xi Jinping to go ahead and take over Taiwan. So we're gonna watch China carefully. Now, is this all there is when it comes to the Russian front? We sanctioned them with the joke sanctions and that's all there is? Not really. Things could get ugly again. For example, the US today sent over 7,000 troops to Germany. And on top of that, we have talk about a cyber attack, a retaliation from the US, attacking Russian infrastructure via cyber attacks. That will elicit a response from Russia. And here we go, the tit for tat could be really dangerous for the stock market. Now, the confirmation that our worst fears when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine tensions, and now it is a war, full-blown war, but the confirmation that our worst fears are not merited, at least for now, was what we talked about in yesterday's video. The indicators that I look at when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine tensions and now war. And these are, by the way, indicators whether the stock market gives a rat's ass about the conflict or not. And the indicators are palladium. If palladium goes higher, the stock market is concerned. Then we have oil. If oil moves higher, then the stock market is concerned about the conflict. Likewise, wheat. When wheat goes higher, the VIX, when the VIX goes higher, similar story. The RSX, but it's different this time around. If the RSX goes down, then we have concerns about the conflict. And lastly, gold. I should have added gold in yesterday's video. But if gold moves higher, this is an indicator that we have a stock market that's being rattled by the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. If the opposite happens, for example, if palladium cools down, then this is an indicator that the stock market doesn't give a rat's ass about the conflict anymore. So let's see what happened today with these indicators. We start with palladium. This is a daily chart for palladium and as you can see, it closed well below the highs. Not even close. A massive reversal. Now, in the long run, is this a bearish development for palladium? Of course not. But from a daily perspective, the reversal in the action was a green light for the stock market to move higher, specifically the names that were beaten down in recent days as the escalations between Russia and Ukraine started to rattle the stock market. Another indicator, what about oil? Brent. Crude oil Brent went higher all the way to almost 106 a barrel. Unbelievable. But look at what happened next. 
after the so-called sanctions were announced, Brent went down and closed at the lows of the day. Again, is this bearish for the long run for Brent? Of course not. But from a daily chart perspective, the reversal was a confirmation for the stock market to go ahead and buy the dip in these stocks that were beaten down in recent days. What about wheat? The difference for wheat is, number one, wheat futures closed a little earlier, so it closed right after the sanction speech. But we also have multiple tailwinds for wheat to move higher. The Russia-Ukraine tensions were just a cherry on top for wheat futures to move higher. But it will be really interesting to see how wheat futures react in the following days because we're getting closer to overbought territory and closer to the resistance at around 950. What about the VIX? Again, early in the morning when the market opened, the VIX popped higher significantly. But right away, it started to reverse and it closed at the lows of the day. This is yet another signal that the market's worries regarding the Russia-Ukraine conflict are easing. And the main worry for the market when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine conflict is inflation. Well, if we're not going to sanction Russian exports, then that's a relief. We're not going to see higher inflation from that alone. Now, the other shoe that could drop is if there is a disruption of supplies from these two countries, and there will be disruption, then we're going to have a problem either way because inflation is going to move higher. But for now, the sanctions eased all of these concerns, but notice that the VIX remains elevated. What about the RSX? Once again, a reminder, when the RSX moves higher, then we're seeing an easing of concerns from the market regarding the conflict. If the RSX moves down, then we're seeing these concerns flaring up once again. Look at the RSX. It moved higher from the lows by about 21%. So once again, is this easing of the concerns about the conflict by the market or are the concerns flaring up again? The answer is this is easing of the concerns, which means equities, specifically the oversold names, should move higher. Lastly, what about gold? Gold popped higher in the morning. Overnight, there was a massive rally for gold. But notice what happened right away when the stock market opened for trading. We saw buying of the dip and gold started to ease. But the majority of the easing took place right after the so-called sanctions announcement. This is yet another confirmation by the market that its worries about the conflict are easing. And this is a green light to buy the dip in the oversold, beaten down names. And I even joked, by the way, using our friend Tom Lee, that even if a nuclear accident happens at Chernobyl right now, the Nasdaq will blast significantly higher. Why? Because more disasters, more tragedies, means that the cocaine policy from the Fed will continue. And the 50 basis points hike that went down to 25 basis points right now will become zero. And soon enough, it will be adding more liquidity and so-called accommodation by the Fed to the stock market. Once again, folks, ladies and gentlemen, the market cares not about anything. Even nuclear accidents don't matter for the stock market. What matters at the end of the day is the co. Came. And the last thing I want to talk about in this subject, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and the impacts on inflation, is the fact that the administration, their supporters, propagandists and puppets all over social media and the likes, they're absolutely out of sight, out of mind, out of touch with the common man and woman. Listen, for example, to Propaganda Minister Saki when she was asked about gasoline prices at the pump that you and I have to pay. Take a listen. But even without all this going on, gas in California is almost $5 a gallon. Should people across the country expect to see that kind of a number when they go to gas up their car? Five dollars, six dollars? Well, again, I think as you heard the president say last week, uh, standing up for our values is not without cost. What we're trying to do is minimize that cost. So I don't have a prediction of it right now because we're trying to minimize the impact on the global energy markets. Once again, out of touch, out of mind. You go ahead and tell the common man and woman filling at the pump right now, paying these insane prices in California. You tell them that it is worth it to save democracy in Ukraine. Oh, really? Listen to the common man, in this case, what they really think about all of this. Russia is one of the largest suppliers of the global energy market. The country is responsible for about 12% of oil, 17% of natural gas. And even though Europe and Asia are more dependent on its supply than the U.S., any disruption could have a global impact and affect prices. Now, President Biden says his administration will use every tool at its disposal to limit the effects here in the U.S., but it's not clear what can be done or how long that might take. Here's what drivers are saying. It's affecting everybody. We, the small people, is always going to be affected by the situation when they make those decisions over there. 
um, all we can do is just continue living and, and providing for our families. Now this guy's the average Joe. This guy's the hard-working American who goes every morning dealing with this inflation to feed their families at the end of the day. This is the backbone of this country. You think this guy gives a rat's ass about Ukraine and preserving democracy over there and all of these arguments? Of course not. And again, I'm not trivializing the tragedy. I'm just saying that the main concern for the public right here in the United States of America is inflation, not Ukraine. Matter of fact, the majority of Americans cannot even point Ukraine on a map. Our knowledge about Ukraine is limited to chicken Kiev. And by the way, how much you want to bet that this guy doesn't even understand or realize that his struggles when it comes to inflation is due to the Federal Reserve's policies. Matter of fact, the majority of the American public doesn't even know what the Fed is. Do you think that this is not done by design? Think again. They're keeping the American public in the dark about the Federal Reserve. Because if guys like this, average Joes and Janes, if they realize that the Federal Reserve created this inflation to prop up the equities and real estate markets to make the rich richer, the pitchfork will come out. Matter of fact, the guillotines will come out. There is a reason why they keep you in the dark when it comes to the Fed and their crimes. Anyhow, folks, the rant is over. Let's move on to cover the market analysis, and we start with the performance of the indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average was up by 92.7 points, or a gain of 0.28%. The Nasdaq, the leader of the day, up 436.10 points, or a gain of 3.34%. The S&P 500 was also higher by 63.20 points, or a gain of 1.5%. And notice the volume, big time. There was a lot of buying of the dip today with higher than average volume. What about the sector's performance today? The leader, number one, capturing the gold medal, technology. And number two, for the silver, communication services. Number three, for the bronze, consumer cyclicals. The laggards of the day were led by defensives, materials, and financials. What about the advance to decline ratios? NYSE, 59% advancing versus 38% declining. The NASDAQ, 64% advancing versus 33% declining. But boy, look at the 52 weeks low. Unbelievable. 808 names in the NASDAQ made a new 52 week lows today versus only 13 names which made new 52 week highs. Moving on to commodities futures. You know the story by now. Crude oil futures exploded higher when we got the news that Russia invaded Ukraine. Matter of fact, Crude oil Brent was as high as 106 bucks a barrel. The WTI almost reached 100 bucks a barrel, but both of them closed well below the highs. The WTI gaining about 1% and Brent gaining about 2%, but the story is not over here. Likewise, and perhaps the most concerning of all, gasoline prices popped significantly higher. At the highs of the session, where we're talking about 13% higher. Luckily for us consumers, gasoline futures closed with about 7% gains today. Heating oil prices were higher, so were natural gas, be it way below the highs. Natural gas pretty much closed at the flat line. And of course, the greedy gas station owners and oil companies will do some price gouging here regardless of the fact that we closed well below the highs. They're going to take advantage and do some price gouging. They're not going to let this opportunity go without lining their pockets. What about softs? We have a rebound day for lumber. Lumber closed the day with gains of almost two and a quarter percent. Yet we have losses led by coffee. Coffee was down big, almost 4% to the downside today, along with cocoa. And the reason is we have concerns about the consumption of lattes and mochas and coffee drinks. Apparently, Russians and Ukrainians drink a lot of coffee and cocoa products. So expect a rebound here sooner or later, specifically in coffee. Yet we also saw declines for cotton futures. On the other hand, OJ and sugar pretty much on the flat line. What about metals? They were blasting higher today, at least earlier in the morning, specifically gold and palladium. But look at this. All of them closed in the red, with the exception of copper with modest gains. Gold lost almost half a percentage point. Silver was down. Platinum was down. Palladium was down. 
a little over 2.5% with a stunning reversal from the highs of the day. And by the way, even aluminum spiked higher today in the tensions. It's not really tensions, it's war by now between Russia and Ukraine. Yet aluminum also closed well below the highs. What about meats? Down day across the board. The slaughterhouse is here. Live cattle is down. Feeder cattle is down. And even the new big tech is down. Lean hangs. We're seeing the rotation from the new big tech to the old big tech. What about grains? Wheat futures close in the green, gaining almost 5.5% today. Likewise, we have gains for soybean oil, canola, corn, rough rice. On the other hand, oats, soybean meal, soybeans were down. The leader of these declines was oats, down almost 2.5% today. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here? We saw some action in the options market, a little bit of a revival, shall we say, but not significant at all, meaning the retail mom and pop are not participating by that much in the options market. Maybe they're buying the dip via stocks, individual stocks, not via the options market this time around, which tells you the algos did a lot of the buying today along with the institutionals. We'll see if that's going to hold or not. But regardless, Apple came at number one, big time, with almost 1.4 million contracts traded today about 59% of those were calls. And at number two, Tesla, the souffle, with a little over 950,000 contracts, about 48% of those were calls. And at number three, AMD, with almost 600,000 contracts traded for the name today, about 60% of those were calls. What about the unusual activities that took place in the options market today? And pay attention now, we have massive trades that could be leading indicators to what's about to come. We start with the ticker double EM for emerging markets. This is the emerging markets ETF. They're buying calls here, the 49 calls for the expiration date, May 20th, with expectations. The name could pop higher by more than 5.5% by then. They paid about one buck and a half a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $6.7 million. What about the trade for the ticker IYR? This is the real estate ETF. They're buying more puts here, expecting more downside for REITs. In this case, the 84 puts for the expiration date, May 20th, with the expectations the IYR could drop by more than 17% by then. They paid about one buck and a half a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about four and a half million dollars. Here's an interesting trade for the TLT. The buying or bidding, the bond prices will go higher, meaning yields will go down, and hence perhaps a continuation of the ratty in the NASDAQ, because we've seen a correlation between the TLT and the NASDAQ as of late, at least. The correlation goes back all the way to a year ago. In this case, they're buying the 145 calls for the expiration date, April 1st, with expectations that the TLT could pop higher by more than 6% by then. And they paid about 70 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.5 million. Here's the interesting trades, both of them for the Qs and the SPY, because they spent a lot of money buying these puts. Let's start with the triple Qs. In this case, they bought the 322 puts with the expiration date May 20th. With the expectations that the Qs will drop down by more than 5.5% by then, they paid about 13 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $16.5 million. So somebody's fading the rip here. What about the SPY? They're also buying puts here, the 382 puts for the expiration date May 20th. With the expectations that the name could drop down by more than 11% by then. They paid about eight bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about eight and a half million dollars. Moving on to the heat map analysis. What's going on here? Some lining up green, others lining up red. Bloodbath. All in all, the map looks like a Christmas tree, but pay attention now. Look at the names that are lining up green. Look at the names that are lining up red. Now let's switch to the year-to-date performance for the heat map. Now, as you can see, the names that are lining up red today are lining up green in the year-to-date map and vice versa. What does that mean? It means that the action today was merely sell the winners by the losers. We cannot read anything more than this from today's action. The situation between Russia and Ukraine is fluid. More sanctions, specifically on exports from Russia, will change the game entirely. But most importantly, 
all eyes on interest rate hikes expectations. If they continue to go down, the technology, momentum, high multiple, the losers for the year will continue to outperform. On the other hand, if these interest rate hikes expectations move higher again, then we will see the resumption of the theme of the year, buy value, dump growth. Speaking of that, let's move on to the heat map for the ETFs. And as you can see today, when we look at the growth section of the market, the IWF, the IVU, IVW, excuse me, the VUG, they're all lining up green big time. On the other hand, value is lagging. Matter of fact, the VTV was down. Likewise, the XLE is down. The XME is down for materials. The XLP for consumer staples is down. So all of the ETFs that have been working so far for the year did not work today. What a difference a change in interest rate hikes expectations makes. Moving on to charts, and we start with a 30 minutes chart for the SPY, the S&P 500. A massive gap down, but immediately an intense buying of the dip, relentless. And the buying did not stop all the way till the end of the day. That tells you, we have a lot of short covering. We have a lot of dip buying. We have a lot of algos reacting to oversold conditions in these indices. Now, the algos can react for one day, but then once these oversold conditions are corrected, they're not going to react the very next day. So we have to continue to rely on shorts doing covering. And these dip buyers, are they going to follow up tomorrow and perhaps next week or not this will determine the sustainability of the bounce that we got today but from a technical perspective alone the chart of the spy caught support at around 410 and a half and it recaptured 422 as support and it's now eyeing the line in the sand at around 430 as resistance. What is the significance of the support line of 410 and a half? Well we have to go back all the way to last year. As you can see around April, May, this line 410 acted as support and resistance over and over and over and over again. So today the same line came to play once again. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500? Once again, a massive rebound higher from around 4100. The rebound recaptured 4232 as support. That is point number one for the bulls. Point number two, the volume spiked higher on the buying side than the selling one. That is point number two on the side of the bulls or for the bull camp. The bears still have the momentum indicators. The momentum indicators, the RSI, the MACD remain in negative territory. So this is a battle. It's not going to be easy. So what will determine the victory for either the bears or the bulls is the fact whether the chart is going to keep the support of 4,232 by tomorrow's closing or not. If this support is retested and we see a rebound higher, then the bulls made significant gains. If, however, the retest of that line is not successful and we see a drop down below 4,232, then we have a bigger problem here. We had a one-day wonder, a one-day bounce of oversold technicals, and it was a bull trap, and we will see more losses to come. What about the Qs, the Nasdaq, 30 minutes chart? Similar story here. We have a massive gap down. It did not go all the way down to my number, 316.46 or 45, doesn't matter to me. But regardless, the Qs caught a bid, intense bid throughout the day with no stop in sight whatsoever. Maybe a little baby drop right around the announcement of the sanctions, but after that, it was non-stop buying. The chart caught 334 as support once again, and now it's eyeing 343, the line in the sand as resistance, and the goal for the bulls here is recapture this line as support by the weekly closing tomorrow. What is the importance of 316 Point forty-five, from my number from where we caught support today. Well, we have to go back to yesterday's video on what I said about the Q's chart from a daily perspective using the Fibonacci levels. Take a listen. Let's apply the Fibonacci levels. And as you can see, the support is way down there at around 316, 317. So this could be a painful journey absent of a rebound by tomorrow. And here it is. We almost went down there and we caught support. So this is a significant zone of support. It is important. This is what the chart is saying. So we have to listen to what the chart is saying. And here is a daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. The chart 
reached the support of 13,599. And then it also reached the support, the very important support, by the way, of 13,300. But it caught a bid from this trend line that you see in yellow. Now, what is the significance of this line? All the horses will get there in a second, but look at the volume. It spiked higher on a green day. On the buying side, this is a good sign for the bulls. We caught multiple support lines in a single day. This is another good sign for market bulls, in this case, NASDAQ bulls. The bears are going to hang their hats on the momentum indicators, but the bears are starting to lose their case because if we have another pop tomorrow, all of these negative divergences on the RSI MACD indicators will reverse right away and the bulls will close the week at a decisive victory. Now, what is the significance of the yellow trend line that you see in the chart right now? Well, we have to go back to yesterday's video. We took a look at the weekly chart, the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. Take a listen. You could draw it this way, even if it is this way. We're not going to visit the line again and catch that rebound unless we go down about 35 to 4%. And here it is, exactly to the penny. The chart caught support from the trend line. And it did not look back since then. Moving on to the IWM, the Russell 2000 small caps, 30 minutes perspective. A massive gap down. We caught support from around 188, which the chart caught support from before. As you can see from the double bottom, the bad news was that the support of 191.5 was breached. The good news is the IWM recaptured that support by the end of the day and then some it got 196 and a half of support now the resistance is 204 and a half we're getting a little overextended here these are vertical moves in a single day you gotta go down and retag some of these support lines and see if they're gonna hold or not in the case of the iwm it is 196 and a half the dixie the dollar index a massive pop higher recapturing 96 of support and then some in this case 97 this is a sign of panic in the stock market a rush to raise cash when the dollar moves higher in an intense fashion like we saw this morning the dollar is getting slightly overbought it could go a little higher it's gonna try to go higher and recapture 97 as support by the end of the week it's gonna be a battle but remember what moves the dollar these days is the russian ruble overnight when the invasion was underway the russian ruble crashed to its lowest level in history yet today after the announcement of the sanctions the mild sanctions shall we say the ruble recover can the ruble continue to recover as we see more bad news from the invasion we'll see but for now the ruble is starting to get a little oversold here the weekly closing is important can the ruble recapture the same support line that it broke overnight when the invasion was underway or will it close below that support line now resistance that goes hand in hand with 97 with the us dollar now what about gold the old man popped higher significantly overnight and then it closed the day at the lows of the session it's a reversal signal at least from a daily perspective gold is getting a little overbought it's actually not a little it's a lot overbought so we're looking for a pullback Will gold pull back all the way down to retest the sloping line of resistance, now support, and then bounce higher from there? Too early to say. The technicals say we're overbought, we're due for a pullback. The fundamentals say we're not out of the woods yet. There is a lot of uncertainty in the market right now. There is a lot of uncertainty when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine war. And gold has proven so far this year that it is the only true safe haven. Not Bitcoin, not tulips, not bonds, not any of that garbage. Speaking of bonds, here's the chart of the 10-year yield. The resiliency of the 10 years is absolutely impressive. You would have thought that as the, as the invasion was underway, the 10-year yield would have crashed. It would have went down to 1.7 maybe 1.6 but it did not and this was an important indicator that the bond market is a little more mature than the stock market what do i mean by that the bond market looked at the situation as inflation is going to go higher either way they can play this game in the stock market about the fed maybe not hiking as much but in the bond market we're not going to play this game in the bond market we're going to look at inflation expectations do you think inflation expectations went down today not really if anything inflation expectations went a lot higher there's gonna be a time maybe tomorrow maybe next week when the stock market is gonna sober up and come to the same reality that the bond market has reached moving on to the tlt weekly chart once again, no update here because we have consolidation in the bond market, be it yields or bond prices. But the message is clear. We're looking at higher inflation either way, and this will mean higher yields 
and lower bond prices. We're now looking for the weekly closing for the TLT. Is it going to close above 134.5? Is it going to close below 134.5? Is it going to close above 140? Or is it going to close below 140? A close above 140 will mean significant gains for the TLT to come. Remember the options trade that we just covered. A close below 134.5 will seal the deal for the TLT and the bond market. Yields higher, prices down. What about the VIX 4 hours chart? We already talked about this chart before but it lost the support of 33 the macd indicator is curling down about to cross creating red impressions in the histogram this will be a confirmation that indeed it was the bottom for the spy today at least from a short term perspective the relief ratty the bear market ratty the dead cat bounce whatever you want to call it so market bulls are seeing a lot of hope here the problem is, even if we have a crossing in the MACD indicator to negative territory, remember that the VIX is still elevated historically speaking. It is still trading above 20. A close above 20 for the week will keep the hope alive for the bears that this is a bull trap. What we got today is a bull trap if the VIX continues to trade above 20. What about the VXN 4 hours chart? Similar story here. We have a reversal candle from a 4 hours perspective. Likewise. The MACD indicator is curling down, it's about to cross to create red impressions on the histogram. All of these are good indicators for NASDAQ bulls. But remember, the line in the sand is the equivalent of 20 on the VIX in the chart of the VXN is 27.5. A close above 27.5 will keep the hope alive for NASDAQ bears. But regardless, if we close the week below today's closing, then this will serve as a sign that the bulls are fighting back. What about Apple, a daily chart? Massive reversal in Apple here, on higher than average volume. The chart decided to ignore my support level of 157, and it rebounded from whatever it decided to rebound, right at the point of the opening of the day. It closed the day above yesterday's lows, so it is not a reversal candle per se, but it is a good sign for the bulls that the chart closed above yesterday's lows. The chart of Apple will now eye the sloping line of resistance in yellow once again and then we'll take it from there. If we have a pullback right away, let's say tomorrow, then we're eyeing 157 as support once again. Of course, Apple bulls want to close the week above the sloping line of resistance. What about Tesla, the souffle, an hourly chart? I told you yesterday, I might have gotten a little early out of the trade, the put trade, but the chart was getting very oversold. So we were due for a bounce, a relief, ratty, a dead cat bounce, doesn't matter to me. But this bounce will last for a little while. And perhaps the chart will move all the way higher, retest the trend line in yellow, and then get rejected from there. And therefore, I cautioned you, the Johnny Come Lately bears who decided to short yesterday or today, don't do it because we have oversold technicals and if you do it book your losses right or your, excuse me your gains right away and by the way we have bad news for the souffle specifically this time around for reverend elon musk himself and his brother fredo musk because fredo came out today and said that the company was very ignorant about the environmental impact of its bitcoin purchase really you didn't do your research you didn't know that bitcoin is horrific for the environment or was it a quick pump for you and your brother to line up your pockets meanwhile you lift a lot of investors who followed your lead holding the bag. And by the way, the SEC is now investigating Reverend Elon and his brother Fredo for dumping right at the top. But remember this, before we got the dump, there was a mysterious pump by the so-called Tesla whale, where Tesla stock surged higher in a short amount of time, and then came the dumping. So will the SEC investigation finally reveal the identity the so-called Tesla whale. I'm looking at you, Fredo. Moving on to BTC tulips. What's going on here? The retest of the support of around 35,750 is good to go for now. The problem is, you're not going to be out of the woods until the chart recaptures 42,000 as support once again. Because for now, who's to say that this is not a bear flag consolidation? And sooner or later, the chart will break below 35,750 once again. And lastly, what about A? AMC, an hourly chart, we got an oversold bounce today. Will the apes follow up 
and build on the gains if they do and preferably by tomorrow can the chart blast higher all the way and retest 21 right away or at least close the week above 18 if there is no follow-up then this is an important development for the chart for this name amc it will tell us right away that the apes are nowhere to be found they're all dead now they're not following up on the algos pump from the oversold technicals moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have a lot. We have the nominal personal income. Then we have nominal consumer spending. Most importantly, we have core PCE inflation, which is the Fed favorite barometer for inflation because it tends to downplay the true nature of inflation. Then we have real disposable income, real consumer spending, durable goods, the University of Michigan consumer sentiment, and lastly, pending home sales. With that, folks, I'm done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.